Happy Monday to y'all. It's uh, Bob McCown's John Shannon with you on uh, this first day of the week. A busy week coming up for uh, the hockey pucks, mm. uh, specifically. Uh, Seattle Kraken will engage in their first real player acquisition exercise with the expansion draft. They have the list right now, right, of players who uh, yes, are available? Yes, they were given the list at 7 o'clock Pacific time yesterday. Uh of all 30 teams, Vegas is not involved in the draft. Uh, all 30 teams that uh, have protected players. And then the, the, those are the, who are available. And do they have the opportunity to talk to these players? No, I'm sure that there are some discussions going on uh, between the teams. Um, uh, but certainly in certain scenarios, when, when there are, uh, Medical issues, they have a chance to look at uh, look at these uh, the medical reports and see how severe the injuries are. Uh, for instance, Shea Weber and Carey Price are both unprotected by Montreal um, for and, and both claim that they're Montreal is claiming that uh, both are have long term injuries and will not be ready for October. Are you buying that? Well, I, I, you can't lie about this stuff because it goes through the NHL office. Um, and, and there are, the league would, would audit all of that stuff. Uh, the question becomes, Weber's, Weber's really severe. Weber may never play again. That's how, that's how bad it may be for him, which is going to be a huge issue for Montreal and for Nashville because of the way his contract was constructed. Uh, but the month, the carry price one is the interesting one, Bob is if, if you want to take the short term risk of taking carry price, um, it might be well worth it to take them unless here's the one thing that we don't know yet. And we will not know until, well, we may not know until after the draft is what side deals that, uh, Ron Francis made with teams to take certain players and not take other players and what he, what he gets in, in return. Um, if you were Seattle, would you take the gamble on Carey Price? If I felt his injury was short term, which means to me short term would be before Christmas, uh, and uh, and if uh, there was a real belief in talking to, I think that you know you you do talk to Price's agent, um, and you say uh, how severe is it, and he'll get over it. You know, there's a lot of positives in drafting Carey Price. You know, first of all, money's not an issue for this franchise. Uh, they have done very well already uh, with tickets and, and corporate sales and broadcast rights. They've done okay. Uh, money is not a problem. They've already, Ron Francis has been given permission to spend to the cap, although he won't, he won't spend to the cap on in, in, in his expansion draft. So spending $10 million for a goaltender, uh, if you look at the Vegas model, having a quality goaltender <laughs> was the right thing to do right off the hop. And Mark Andre Fleury proved to be that guy in Vegas. And so, if Carey Price could be that guy for Seattle, there is some logic to it. Uh, I'm not saying it's it's a, it's a, an empty net goal, but I'm telling you that uh, if I'm Ron Francis, I'm certainly thinking about it, and we'll need to be convinced of otherwise. Well, the mitigating factors there for me would be, you know, Flurry was not alleged to be injured at the time that Vegas drafted. No, in fact, in fact, what happened, Flurry actually waived his no move contract only to go to Vegas. Right. Uh, Price, on the other hand, as you acknowledge, is alleged to have some injury of some severity. Knee or hip, knee or hip. Uh, having said that, he played every game during the final and uh, in the playoffs. Mm-hmm. So one wonders what the severity of that is and played very well, at least until the first few games of the final. Uh, he was pretty good through the final. I don't, I don't, I wouldn't. Well, whatever. I'm not blaming him for anything that. that oh, I'm not either. Did. I'm just yeah. saying that there's no real evidence of right. the injury impacting him, which is not to say there isn't one. Yeah. But. I tell you what, I mean, there's, there would... are, there's evidence to me that points to it, to Carey Price being logical a logical choice for Seattle from Montreal. And that is, uh, he grew up in Anaheim Lake, which is in British Columbia. He yeah. summers in Kelowna. His wife is from Southwestern 
sorry, southeastern Washington State, a, a little town called Kennewick, uh, where he uh, where he met her while he was playing for the Tri City Americans in in the Western League. Uh, there's there's a lot of positives of Carey Price becoming a Seattle guy. Oh, I get it. Um, on the other hand, some would be surprised that Montreal would have approached him because he had no trade right? and he had to waive it. And he mm -hmm. apparently has waived it only for Seattle, correct? Only for the expansion draft. That's correct. Yes. Right. So now one wonders what's Montreal's motivation, having just gone to a Stanley well, Cup final. The motivation is to get rid of $10 million in the cap. Well, that's all, that's all well and good, but do they have a goaltender that's capable of filling in? And I'm not sure that Alan is that guy, are you? No, uh, but long term, I suspect it's supposed to be Caden Primo, who's uh, who played a bit last year and has played in the American League. And if Jake Allen can get through this season, then I'm sure it will be Caden Primo's job the year after. Well, but you're about to lose a goaltender who I would argue was the only reason you made it to the Stanley Cup final. Mm -hmm. um, and you're going to get rid of your most experienced defenseman. Well, you're not getting rid of him. He just can't play, Bob. Well, you've you haven't protected him, and he's you're going to lose him. Let's put it that way. In all likelihood, Why, uh, whether he goes somewhere else, or well, whether he retires, or whether he can't play. Yeah, well, he's not, not going. I mean, him. if they if, if they take Carey Price, then they only you only every team only lose one guy. No, so. no, John, I, I'm I understand that. Oh. What I'm saying is, it appears as if Weber is not going to play for the Montreal Canadiens next year. Correct. It appears that way. So now Weber is, you X Weber out, even though there's a contract yet, and you X Carey Price out. That's a big chunk of significant experience gone from your team. And it leads me to believe you're going to take a significant step backwards before you can even contemplate taking another step forward, mm -hmm. which raises the question, does the general manager feel that this whole thing was just a, a fluke, a, a happenstance? rather than a real revelation of how good this Montreal team actually what do you is, think? has become. What did you think? Uh, I think it was a fluke. So do I. And I think Mark Bergevin smart enough to know that. And when you consider that they're going back to the old divisions and you're going to be seeing, playing in the same division as Tampa and Florida and Boston and Toronto and a, a, tough, an, a tough Ottawa team that's on the rise, this is, maybe this is the time to already think about what we're going to do in two or three years from now. Well, we're going to talk a, a lot more about the, the um, upcoming expansion draft in the uh, days to come. In fact, uh, the general manager who conducted the last expansion draft and um, did the best job of anybody so far. Now, granted, he was given the tools to be able to do that, but he was extremely creative mm -hmm. and, um, and made some moves that nobody prior to him, I guess, had ever made. Yes? Correct. Also had the best pool of players to deal with because the one thing when you sp spend half a billion dollars on a, on a franchise, somebody's finally said, well, if we're going to, if he's going to spend half a billion dollars at a franchise, Bill Foley, we better give him some players to pick from. And that's the expansion rules this last time. And this time are much more favorable than previous expansions. Well, we'll get to that a little bit later on. Um, all this past weekend, we saw the last uh, major championship in golf for the year, which is still bizarre to me that the majors are over by the end of July. Uh, of course, the PGA was moved to earlier in the year. Um, but this is the first year we've actually gone through mm -hmm. a semi-normal year with this format. Nonetheless, um, young man, Colin Morikawa, uh, prevailed. And it raises the question of how good is this guy? And we're going to address that topic with our, uh, our two golf guests. Uh, when we return, Ian Leggett, Richard Zokel will join us after these messages. Uh, and we are back. It's McCowan. It's uh, Shannon. And with us um, are two golfing friends. Uh, Ian Leggett, Richard Zokel are uh, with us. I mentioned to Shannon off the top that... Uh, I find it very weird that here in a Monday uh, on in mid July, we have now seen the last major championship of the year. We have nothing left to look forward to. The PGA of course has been moved. This is our first real year of experiencing this in this way. How do you guys feel about it? Lego, you like this idea? Well, I, well, I mean, 
in the PGA Tour's mind, the major hasn't even started yet. That's their FedEx Cup. But yeah. you know, it's uh, and that's the premise behind that. And the President's Cup is that you got to realize that the PGA Tour doesn't own any of the five biggest properties in golf. Um, so they've created the FedEx Cup. So in their mind, the schedule works perfect for them. And I think it keeps interest level high. Um, it's not up against any, you know, baseball playoffs and NFL season starting. So, you know, the, the, you know, supposed to be the sporting light is shined on the PGA tour around major championships and the FedEx cup. So that's what we have to look forward to is if anybody really cares about another millionaire making 10 million during the FedEx cup, that's what we get to look forward to. Dick. Yes. I, I, Lego's right. Uh, historically, the majors are over in August. They, they, they ship with the PGA championship in August. And uh, since they moved to the springtime, now the major championships are finishing right now. We're in, we're in mid July. And um, you know, it's interesting because every, every historically the masters, we can't wait for the masters. It's here. It's over. Then boom, all the four majors are over and summer's gone, but wow. it fits very nicely into the overall a package of the PGA tour because they get to shine. And as Lego said, and, and talk about and, and show the FedEx cup and the finals and give someone $15 million. And then golf is over after Labor Day and we can watch, uh, get back to football. <laughs> Golf's not over. <laughs> the, the next season starts in about a month. I mean, well, that, the, the, over, the over, I mean, the old days of a hey, golf ended in a calendar year and then started in the next calendar year that's gone yes, that's disappeared is. i mean everybody gets six weeks off and they're back at it <laughs> and i that's like true. the rotation zoke i think i i like that the pga is not the last event because i think there's a there's a greater importance on the other three majors around the u.s open the open and the masters and i think that i i like the way the rotation works now is that mm. it, call it the lesser of the four majors is not played last. Um, I, I think it puts a better, pre bigger precedent on the PGA championship. It absolutely does. I think they've figured this formula out and uh, they're nailing it right now. Well, I, I will say, and I, I don't want to be, you know, the old man, get off my lawn. Um, but um, in my mind, it diminishes the significance of the TPC. Um, the tour championship. Yeah, the tour championship, the tournament players championship. Well, and and just because of a timing thing, I mean, we've got we we start with majors like in the second month of the year, and then we've got one. I mean, if the if you consider TPC one of them, yeah. The well, I think yeah. Lego. I, I think, think those. What, 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 I mean, his point being is, I think what the tour has done once again is they're trying to compete with the major championship by putting the players championship in March and getting in front of the masters. Mm -hmm. Right. Absolutely. It doesn't work. <laughs> no. Well, they're doing their best they can. Absolutely. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's slid in there. Their, 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 their strategy is to introduce it and force it down our throat that it's the fifth major. Some accept it, some reject it, but um, they're in the best position as well. So, yeah. okay. Speaking of jamming it down our throat, uh, before we talk about the the open, um, how important is an Olympic gold medal? I mean, Justin Rose is the defending Olympic champion. There is an Olympic tournament starting soon. Uh, where do you guys rank that as far as importance, Ian? I, I mean, I, I think it's going to become more and more important. I, I do, and I, I think unfortunately, when you think of you know the return to uh, golf at the Olympics has been, you know, wounded, if you want to call it that. I mean, we, we had the virus or whatever the, you know, the mosquito virus was called in, yeah, in, in Brazil, Brazil yeah. you know, so that was an issue where players didn't want to go. Now you've got another issue with, um, you know, coronavirus. So golf's return really hasn't had a clear pathway of importance to players around a gold medal, where I think that fingers crossed the next Olympics, um, doesn't have any of these issues underlying that's going to cause players not to attend. I think by Rory's return, irrespective of his comments about not being that patriotic, sees the importance of it. And I think when it's all said and done, it's just, it's going to look like Justin Rose is going to have a U.S. Open and Olympic gold medal. 
And, you know, Rory McIlroy might have five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten majors by the time it's all said and done, but he won't have a gold medal. And I think that when he looks back on his career, uh, maybe potentially not playing in Brazil or participating, and Dustin Johnson may do the same as not participating. I think when it's all said and done, when careers are written, um, that is going to be a highlight on everyone's resume. Well, let's get to the, uh, the Open. And I have an issue with calling it the Open, too. Um, for years, it was the British Open. And there are a bunch of other Opens in the world. And um, the fact... He's in a good British, mood today, boys. He's in a good mood today. The fact that the British insist that their championship is somehow uh, worthy of being the only one called the Open. I know it's the oldest. I know that's where the game was found. Although it was founded in Scotland, they play more of them in... in um, well, do they play more in England than Scotland? I guess they play about the same number, don't they? More in Scotland. More in Scotland still? Yeah. Well, in any event, what we saw was um, another intriguing story in Colin Morikawa winning this one. Only two men in history have won two majors out of their first eight that they've played in. And the other one besides Morikawa is, of course, the legendary Bobby Jones, who did it almost 100 years ago. And um, so it's hard to equate those two as being parallels. This is a very significant achievement. But it raises the question in my mind, are we going to look at Morikawa the same way we looked at McElroy, the same way we looked at Spieth, the same way we've looked at other young players who have burst out of the gate? And are they the next Tiger Woods? And da, 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 da. And is there something about Morikawa's game that implies to you two guys that he could be the next truly great player, wherever your bar is there. Lego, to you first. Um, I, I think so. It's funny. I had this conversation last week with, uh, with Claude Harmon about, you know, the talent level on the PGA Tour. And when is the next era in the game where someone dominates world number one? And that is, a, I mean, that world number one's been a revolving door now since you know, pretty much the last five or six years. Um, and who is going to be that next person? I mean, I, I don't think we can really predict that. I think the dedication, the incredible maturity you see at such a young age. And I know, Zok, I don't know if you saw uh, Morikawa's tweet that he put out about, you know, execution. I know you must have been licking your chops when you read that. Yes. Um, but it was, that showed an incredible amount of maturity. It wasn't about, you know, hitting the ball far, um, the way he speaks, the way he plays the game, mm -hmm. the way he continues to evolve. And he's still evolving, by the way. He's got two major championships. and In two uh, starts. Yeah, exactly. And I think that when you look at that, I think he very well has a high probability of taking over world number one for a very substantial amount of time. Um, I think the volatility that you see in injury related issues that, you know, Roy McElroy and Dustin Johnson and Bryson DeChambeau and, um, you know, Brooks Kepka seem to continue to have. I don't think there's consistency in the game with Justin Thomas. So I think potentially he has the ability to really take a long run at holding world number one. I just like the way he speaks. I like the way he plays the game. Now, does he get jaded by the success and the money and all the rest of it? That time will tell. Exactly. I think, uh, you know, he's the first person ever. No one has ever entered their first PGA championship and won. Colin did that. This was his first open championship. Sorry, Bob. British open championship that he played <laughs> in and he won. No one's ever done that. That no. is remarkable. And, and Colin Morikawa it represents what is great for golf. We don't have this petulance of Brooks Kepka and Bryson DeChambeau, this sideshow, which is good for golf, I suppose, in some aspects, brings eyeballs to it. But he is now going to be put in a, on a platform where, as Lego said, he's going to be tested like Spieth did, like everyone's going to be tested that's in that realm. And we're going to watch a young, very mature mind. He's got this blend of humbleness, humility, his ability to be present and handle very difficult situations extremely well. I don't look at Colin Morikawa as having a great golf swing. 
but I see him as being able to execute shots in very difficult situations in an extraordinary way. That is what's making him so quite fantastic. And we're going to watch him go through this gauntlet because it's going to change his life as Lego was talking about, and he's going to have to deal with it. And, and, and I think he, the one thing that he, that differentiates him from those others is his mindset is his mental maturity. And we're you know, going we're to have to watch it. Dick, they, 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 he talked about all weekend is he, he this is the second Lynx course yes. he's ever played. Yes. The first Lynx course was the Scottish open last week, last week. And, <laughs> and he said, it didn't, I, it didn't matter that I won or lost. It's just that I, I, I understood more about how to play Lynx golf. How That's, difficult, how difficult is that change? Extremely. So that is the fastest learning curve <laughs> I have ever seen. I, it took me, you know, I played in six Dunhill cups for, for Canada at the old course. It took me 20 rounds of golf to learn how to play and finally get, and I'm going to say with air quotes, finally get how to play the ground game. And, and it's a steep learning curve to go from playing golf in North America, which is strictly a target and a yardage um, uh, aspect of it. But in Lynx golf, where you need to, you need to know how the ground's going to react, how the wind is going to affect it, adjust your trajectories, land the ball in this spot so it can run 30 yards and take this massive break to end up in that spot. And that is a steep learning curve. He did it in one, one week. Well, he did it, uh, um, whether it was to his benefit or not, uh, significantly, he did it without the peril of the wind, yeah. which is usually the great defense of British Open golf courses. And certainly St. George's is, would be uh, among those. Um, uh, was it a record score? It was a it was close to no. a record score at, at St. George's, if not. And it was, I mean, the, 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 the weather was perfect. I know they said they were saying yesterday it was the warmest day of the year. Mm. They probably won't have another day like that all year in Sandwich. Um, did that help him? Hurt him? Well, it played, I guess we it, don't know. I, it played into his strength. And, 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 you know, as you know, the game of golf is you have to play the ball in this situation and in this moment right now. And that was, you know, if it was gusty, who knows? Maybe, maybe, uh, Maybe other people would have had a, a better advantage, but the way the golf course played uh, this past few days, and uh, he was ready, he grabbed it. It uh, it was fantastic stuff. The, the There's two, one thing that that resonates with me with this kid, and this is something that happened to me many years ago. I, I finished playing around uh, with, with Tiger, and on the 16th hole, we had to come back on Saturday morning and finish. And the 16th hole at Warwick Hills, though, is a par five, pretty wide open hole. Tiger's first shot, he duck hooks it 30 yards out of bounds. And he gets up on the next, takes his next, he takes a provisional and hits it 300 down the middle of the fairway. So we're sitting having breakfast afterwards. And I asked him about that particular shot. And he said to me directly, I said, how do you get up there and hit it 300 down the middle after you just duck hooked the first one out of bounds? He goes, I don't have an emotional attachment to any shot I hit. Mm -hmm. I get that from Colin Morikawa and the way that yes. he played the game. And you talk on two ends of the spectrum between yes. Bryson DeChambeau and Colin Morikawa and the British Open really tests you on that dynamic of not having any emotional attachment to any shot. Because once that ball hits the ground, you have no control over it. And you've got to let it go. are yes. emotional about where that ball ends up. <laughs> good or bad, right. then you have no chance of winning at a British Open. And one guy that took, you know, to Zoke's point of how long it took Zoke to do it. Think about how long the maturity of Phil Mickelson took over right. the British Open, how much he hated the British Open. And finally, he matured enough after, what, 20 years, finally committing himself to accepting of those, uh, you know, inappropriate bounces that you get. And I see Colin Morikawa, no matter if it's British Open or not, he doesn't seem to have an emotional attachment to any shot he hits. Speaking, like, of, yep. speaking of emotional, um, John Rahm was, you know, never seemed to be too far out. And yet, I mean, he could have been so much closer had his putter worked on the front nine, I assume. And uh, what, what is it that Rahm is doing that, that keeps, keeps him at the top of a leaderboard right now? Well, first of all, his power, 
He's uh, and his ability to drive the ball puts him at the top of the echelon with that. And then what we watched at the U S open is his ability to make those putts anytime, which, which was no different than Bryson DeChambeau's um, uh, model that he used at Wingfoot to win, mm-hmm. you know, long off the tee and a remarkable short game and, and, and managing yourself. Rom is doing that really well. He's, he's such a good player. I mean, he left a lot of shots out there. Uh, he wasn't even on his game this week. He had a good finish, but um, he was just out of it a little too much. But, you know, getting back to um, Collins, uh, Morikawa's ability, his coach, Dr. Rick Sessinghaus, was talking how they developed this ability to detach from results or the outcome. So once that shot's gone, as Lego was saying, you're, it's out of control. It could bounce this way. It could bounce that way. And you have to let it go. And, uh, you know, George Newton talked about it. Everyone is talking about this aspect. If you want to get to that next level, you've got to learn to uh, detach that emotional uh, connection to whatever the results are, good and bad. Um, one of the things that we see in British courses are bunkers that are punishment they are generally severe certainly with um all the facing that's on the deep the depth of the bunkers at most british courses but certainly at at st george's you hit it in there and you hit it in the wrong place in the bunker and your your punishment is automatic Mm. there's no question about it you are you're you're chipping you're, you're you're blowing it out somewhere that you don't want to you're taking a penalty shot. North American golf courses, as a general rule, do not follow that pattern. With good players, bunkers today are no, no I apologize for the phone ringing, are no um, more severe than grass in many ways. Do you like that? Should a bunker actually be punishment? Lego. I, I agree. Yeah, absolutely. The, the one thing about the two is, is you'll notice those are fairway bunkers. Um, Michael Clayton and I, who's a great golf course designer and a, you know, very, very good player. Americans, uh, you know, sort of architecture, those are not fairway bunkers. Like you don't see bunkers in the fairway. No. Um, in, in sort of anything that Jack Nicholas has built or anything, but the old style, those are fairway bunkers. So they're challenging you to drive the ball into certain areas where they're using those to, I mean, you take the bunkers away. And so can I talk about this all the time? Bunkering can change a golf course. You could take the most ordinary golf course on the planet and put some phenomenal bunkering on it. And it, it really could turn itself into a world-class venue. Um, but again, I'm all for the landmines. I, I think that it actually creates a challenge and to go into you know, what we were just talking about, it's not just a, uh, you know, a, a physical challenge. It's a mental challenge when you stand on the tee of, you know, that they're out there. So, and it is, it's an absolute penalty. You look at the amount of British Opens without the exception of possibly just thinking off the top of my head is Dustin Johnson at the last time it was at St. George's hitting it out of bounds. But how many British Opens have been lost because someone drives it into one of those bunkers? Right. Very, very seldom is it somebody hits it in the water, like you know what happened, you know, at the famous Carnoustie incident, and you know Dustin Johnson hitting it out of bounds. But it's usually a bunker travesty that ends up causing them to lose a British Open. I I love it. I personally absolutely love it. I love the penal bunkers. I think we. Uh... PGA Tour players today, given when they prefer to be in the bunker than the long grass, Bob, yeah. is, is what you were talking about. It's easier and and um, it shows. And, you know, the one of the most fascinating stories that I've ever experienced happened in the road bunker at the old course, the Dunhill Cup. I'm playing Mark O'Meara. We're playing the United States and I hit it in the road bunker and I've got two shots. I'm two shots up on O'Meara and I decide that I'm going to play an aggressive you know, to get out and go for the pin rather than come out sideways and being a, an excellent bunker player and always highly confident, I hit the best shot I could and I couldn't get out of it. It was extremely penal. Then I couldn't get out of it sideways. Then I'm in my feet print and I take four shots to get out of it. Peter Alice broadcasting this, I'm climbing out of this bunker 
And Peter Alice says, yes, it looks as though a couple of Shetland ponies have been mating in there. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, these are bunkers. These are hazards. They're, they're, when you're in them, you have to make a decision to face the challenge, come out sideways, play it conservatively. And if you don't perform, it just nails you. And I, I like that about what what, this is what bunkers should be. Yeah. Speaking well, of- there's no more. There's no more famous bunker. I don't think anywhere in the world than on 17 at uh, at the old course. Yeah. Uh, the bunker in at the front left of the green there, the better known as the Sands of Nakajima, because Tommy Nakajima went in there and took a bunch of swipes. He, he putted it in there from the green. That's right. <laughs> He's putted yeah. It. That's right. Yeah, that's right. But <laughs> once he got in, it wasn't yeah, fun. He couldn't get out. He could. Hey, not hey what uh, what is um, talk about forgetting? forgetting a shot forgetting a, a no attachment to a, a a shot what's louis used Hazen thinking today ian well i i think he's got to be thinking you know sundays are an issue for him you know he, ultimately he's had an opportunity to win you know except with the exception of the pj every major this year um so i, I think that it's about it you know going to zoke's uh area of expertise on mental uh, execution is that that he has to check that out and Colin Morikawa made that comment in a tweet that he said it was says you know you can you can make bad golf swings everybody's going to make bad golf swings and yeah. that's just part of the game but what a player can't stand is where he executes poorly and you know Jordan Speed did it on 17 uh, Louis Ustazen's done it now multiple times where he plays beautifully through 54 holes and doesn't seem to be able to e- execute. He makes mental mistake after mental mistake on Sundays. And he's going to have to, you know, he's getting, he's not, you know, a young guy anymore. And he's got these opportunities where, you know, his resume looks like it should have six or seven major championships on it. But it, this is a Sunday execution issue that he's going to have to sit back and figure out how he gets over this. Well, the other thing too, guys, is I think in golf as much as any other sport, success breeds success, but failure also breeds failure. Once you fail to achieve something, um, that whisper is in the back of your head for a long, long time. And the mental side of it, what you golf, whether it be each shot in a round, each round or each tournament, there's a series of resets and there's hard resets and soft resets that you have to reboot and, and, and change the software, so to speak. So a guy like um, uh, Morikawa, if he hits a bad shot, he does a soft reset because he's in a great mindset. So each shot, assess the situation and then execute. But it, when when Ustays and now that he hasn't been able to perform on Sundays when he's had the chance to win majors, he's gonna have to do a hard reset. He's gonna have to change something inside change that software because what the programs he's running in his mind isn't working it's not getting him over the goal line so a hard reset is in order and if you don't do that you just keep running this whole golf insanity thing over and over and over again and you and uh, rory McElroy's in the same boat he's he's not making this progress he, his his uh, he's making mental poor mental mistakes he's wasting a lot of shots and it's removing them out of the position to be in contention. Uh, I got a couple more uh, things I want to talk about, um, particularly Canadians and their performance over the course of the, uh, the weekend. Let's do that in a minute. We'll take this break and back after these messages. McCowan and Shannon, Ian Leggett, Richard Zokel are uh, with us today, as uh, obviously we are discussing golf. Mackenzie Hughes, Corey Connors were both, for lack of a better term, in contention. Um, It seemed unlikely that they were going to be able to win uh, going into the final round. It would have taken something extraordinary for that to happen. It didn't. Uh, Mackenzie Hughes had a decent final round. Uh, Corey Connors struggled. Connors has been in contention with some regularity the last few months. Is he on the verge of a significant breakthrough? Um, is it something more than his putting that is letting him down? Because Tita Green, he's as good as anybody, isn't he, Lego? Yeah, it's all putting for, for him right now. I mean, it's the only thing that's not making him 
uh, you know, he's a top 40 player in the world. That's the only thing not making him a top five or 10 player in the world. You cannot be 133 or whatever he is in putting on the PGA tour and expect to be a top 10 player in the world. You can't expect your ball striking to show up you know, to such a degree that that is the thing that carries you to the finish line. So can, you know, let you know, very, very seldom does anybody win on the PGA tour that doesn't putt well. I mean, I, I yeah. think I, I remember seeing a thing, the only player ever to win at the masters that finished outside a top 15 and putting that won that tournament was VJ Singh. Um, and VJ took the approach and everything that he did was that the ball striking could offset his, you know, liability around his putting, even though he worked extremely hard on it, but he knew that was, and, but of course he's trying to address it. But again, I live by the belief, great putters are born good putters. You can work on that. You mean Ben I Crenshaw, agree. you mean, you look at the greatest putters of all time. They didn't evolve into that. They always were now good putters. You look at Dustin Johnson's made himself a very good putter. Um, you're not a great putter. Um, Colin Morikawa, great putter. He's always been a great putter. You know, Jordan Spieth, always great, been a great, great putter. putter. He struggled. Yeah. Sure, he struggled. But, mm -hmm. I mean, these are things that you're born with, that you come along with, uh, it, you know, through your, you know, growing up in, in, in being a great putter. So, Corey Connors is going to have to address the liabilities. And he sees that. He knows that. It's improved slightly. Um, but, again, it's always interesting to me, and I've had this debate, why is it? that Canadians are terrible putters. <laughs> I don't get it. <laughs> because if you look at the stats, they're all terrible. I mean, Mike Weir might have been the exception as a very, very good putter. But, I mean, you know, Newton, average putter. You know, oh, Newton was well, – no, he was worse than average. He was awful. <laughs> he was awful. Correct, Zokel. He was awful. And worse Again, than that. I don't know why the Canadian thing is such a, a, a you know, an issue. Well, worse worse than being a horrible Folks putter. Got a theory on Newt that because I know we've talked about it. Before. Newtson yeah. didn't care, and maybe he didn't care because he he realized he couldn't be much better, or maybe it was just because he he was bored with with putting. He just didn't think it was part of the game. Yeah. He wanted it removed from the game, and, and my theory <laughs> yes, on, my theory on that is I think most. Canadians because of like Mo Norman and George Newton, we've all kind of become great ball strikers. I Very agree. rarely do you see great ball strikers. It's a different mindset. You know, you can be a very logical and understand the sequence of the golf swing, but the, the uh, art of putting just doesn't, it isn't congruent with logic. It's feel. And, and, and so I, I think generally speaking, we Canadians in general have kind of, favored ball striking because of our, our uh, we followed like Mo and, and George, but um, you know, how that, do you that, teach field then? Dick? Well, you practice like now Lego, you know how, what kind of, I was a pretty mediocre putter at in my prime and, and, and a solid ball striker it was a good ball striker. But do you know that in 2002, I just found this out. Statistically, I had, I was the number one putter for all putts between 10 and 15 feet for the year. And I just blew my mind. And, and, and so you can learn, I, but I agree. I was never a great putter. I learned to be a good putter, but great putters are absolutely born because I think it's the mindset they have. They feel everything first and foremost. And I think you, in order to be a great putter, you have to have a great feel dominant mindset. And a belief too. Shady. Well, that's all I, a part I think, of you. I think that's, you know, that's the key. It's very difficult to create an entirely different you know belief structure at 30 years of age um again uh that's something that's incredible to me is when you look at someone like bernard langer for instance is how he continues has recreated himself Four over times. and over again and bernard langer by the way is a great putter um, and he's been a great putter four different times in his career when you think of it and how he's been able to get over that hurdle. But again, Zoke's absolutely right. It's, you know, I, uh, you know, Canadians are renowned for being great ball strikers and very, very poor putters. And it's an, un it's something very unusual. I never thought about it because I just, I guess we should just blame it on George and Mo. <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, uh, both of you mentioned, uh, speed. And in listening to him after the tournament yesterday, he said he lost the tournament on 17 and 18 on Saturday. 
because of those two bogeys, because he felt it was more important for him to be in the final group. And uh, can you explain what being in the final group on the final day is mentally when you know you're going head to head with the guy you have to beat, Dick? Well, I've never been in the final group in a major on the final day, but um, I, my only equivalence to that was being in the final group in the Canadian Open when I had the lead with Curtis Strange, who was number one in the world. And that was overwhelming for me at that time. It's certainly not overwhelming for Jordan Speed. It's actually right in his wheelhouse. And he's absolutely right. If he was in the final group, then the situations change with every little nuance. And this, it would have been a different situation. And, and uh, looking Colin in the eye, may, it may have been futile, but it may have made the difference. We won't know. But I like the, I love where Jordan is. He is back. He played exceptionally well. From the seventh hole on, he smelt blood in the water. If, more, if, Colin Moore, if there was no such thing as Colin Morikawa, Jordan Spieth would have another major in his, in his um, rack. And we'd be talking about he is back. Um, before we get off uh, Hughes and Connors, which of these two has a better chance of having a better career? Because They are the two preeminent, I think, Canadian golfers right now. There are a bunch of other guys yeah. out there who have had you know, their yeah. shot. But these are the two guys I think I'm looking at, and I think we all are. Which of these two has the better chance to be to, you know, prevail? Um, you know, I I'm actually going to go off script here and go Taylor Pendrith. By the well, way, well, that's the other guy I wanted to mention. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, there's no doubt about it, and I love the the quality of players that are out there because they're going to start dragging each other along, um, which is going to be fantastic. So, um, but I think. Taylor Pendrith has skills that neither one of those guys have. And I'm talking about incredible distance. And he is a good putter, by the way. Um, has the ability to shoot incredibly low numbers after low number after low number. And I think when, you know, going to, you know, your, your comment, they're smelling blood in the water. As soon as Taylor Pendrith is able to win on the PGA mm. Tour, it is going to be something i don't know i've had lots of conversations with him he already thinks he's a winner on the pj tour but i think you got to prove that to yourself when you get out there and as soon as he proves that 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 to himself i mean i just i don't know if unless an injury pops up again uh, that sort of derailed well, him a few years ago um he's been pain free been playing great now for three or four years i think taylor pendrith is the one player that we really need to keep an eye on but again, I mean, does Corey Connors figure out this putting liability and become a better putter? Uh, you know, who knows? But, but the, the thing I like about it is all three of these guys, where a guy like David Hearn, for instance, you know, um, Adam Hadwin specifically, didn't have the win rate that these guys had coming out on tour. These guys know how to win. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it doesn't matter whether it was at age 12 or it was a, you know, a college tournament. Mm -hmm. Now the Corn Ferry Tour, the McKenzie Tour, these guys know how to win golf tournaments. And that's just something that they, they, they're going to carry with them. So as soon as it's open, I think it's going to be it's going to be interesting to watch. I think um, uh, Corey and McKenzie are building a foundation like building blocks with every pr week they play and get in and taste this competition, they're getting more and more comfortable with it. So in order for Corey to get comfortable and settle down so he can make those putts like he does in the first few rounds to get into contention, that's when he will be able to knock, knock a major off. So I think they're setting for the foundation, both of these guys. And I think that foundation is for the next uh, Canadian to win a major championship. But uh, Taylor Pendrith, you're absolutely right. He's got the power. You know, we helped him out with our Mind Track um, uh, app uh, a couple of years ago, and he is. It, it enabled him to help him get to that next level. He's got to get to that. He's got to break through and win. It's too bad that he hasn't able wasn't able to win on the Corn Ferry Tour yet because that's his next thing. But I think Lego's absolutely right. He's got a great short game. And, and he's got a great mindset and he's got great power. So when, when he gets out on the PJ tour, I think he's going to feel very comfortable and he's, uh, his, um, his potential is going to become unleashed.
Well, I think he had his best week ever opposite the British Open uh, this past weekend. Yeah. Uh, finishing, yeah. uh, did you finish fifth, Lego? I think. Uh, I finished. I think he finished eleventh. But again, he's oh, he's okay. only playing temporarily on open weeks. On mm -hmm. he'll, he'll be a full time member here in another month or so. So, um, well, a couple months. But uh, again, he's he is got incredible, incredible talent. So uh, don't be surprised uh, to see him. This is a thing that kind of be quite honestly pisses me off to tell you the truth with <laughs> the amount of quality players that we have like why do like i mean nobody talks about taylor pendrith or these guys the way that you know the u.s talked about ricky fowler when he came out we should be talking about taylor pendrith the way that you know uh you know you talk about americans that come out we should be expecting these guys every single week to play great because they're great players mm -hmm. this can this is a canadian mentality thing that we have uh, you know, and I think that this is the change and the reason why we're seeing, you know, the guys that are playing on the PJ tour at such a high level is they don't necessarily have that Canadian mentality, but us as golf fans, as media should have a level of expectation out of these guys to perform at the highest levels. And I think that would breed confidence in these guys as well. I think so. there's only one person in our country. We have that expectation for, and that's Brooke Henderson. Well, I mean, yeah, but we do that now only because she's succeeded. We didn't yeah. in the beginning. No, I, mean, I know you're right. For, we waited. She didn't wait too like, long, Lego. She didn't wait too long to be successful. No, know? that's absolutely right. Absolutely. Yeah. She kind of jammed it down our throats, you know, pay attention. <laughs> yeah. uh, when she was like 16, 17. Very un-Canadian of her, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, her, hum guys. Her, hum her humbleness is very Canadian, though, isn't it? It is. It totally. Yes, it is. Yeah. yeah. Um, We've kept you longer than we uh, had intended, but it's a fascinating conversation. We'll look forward to the next opportunity to uh, chat. Uh, thank you, boys. Uh, nice Gentlemen, to see you, you as always. Thanks always so much. Uh, we'll be back after these messages. And we are back. And our thanks again to Ian Leggett and Richard Zokel for uh, joining us. Uh, the golf season goes into cruise control until they get to the tour championship. And... Um, Ryder Cup this year, though, Bob. The FedEx. Are you a, I mean, I like the Ryder Cup. It's fun to watch. But the it's lack... Fun to watch. I, I must say this. The absence of a Canadian presence mm -hmm. um, mitigates it for me. Yeah, I, I still... I, I like I like the, the team competition. I like the pressure that these guys finally... It, it's funny. As an individual sport, when they get involved in playing for their team... Uh, their attitude changes. I, it, it's, a, it's an enjoyable three days. Uh, what do we got on the agenda tomorrow? Well, you listen, I, I know it's hard to believe, but the NBA season's not over yet. <laughs> and and it's, it's game. It's close. Game six is Tuesday night. Uh, game seven, I think, is on Labor Day. So it's. Uh, <laughs> oh, it's not. Well, no, I mean, it's just taken forever. Well, so game, game six in Milwaukee could. Uh, could be the NBA champions for the first time in 50 years, 50 years, which means that every Toronto newspaper will bring up 55 years for the Toronto Maple Leafs. So. Well, when was the last time the Phoenix Suns won a championship? Uh, I don't believe they've won one, Bob. That's correct. So <laughs> 50 years is long, but technically Phoenix's run is longer. Yeah. Uh, Cause they, they have and no I, memory I of it. Tell one. you what, it, after game two, I think a lot of people said, Oh, this is all they have to do is win one in Milwaukee. This is done. But boy, did they hit a wall and, and uh, guys like me are eating our words on Giannis because he has been spectacular. Yeah, I, I got to tell you, I thought, um, you know, and getting a chance to watch him more regularly than you do during the regular season, I thought, wow, this guy, you know, is a little overrated. Um, Ooh. Ooh. Uh, you know, the Raptors allegedly had great interest in him before he signed as a contract extension. I thought, well, they made, they made a good move and by not getting him. Yeah. Now I'm not so sure. But I'll tell you what, Chris Middleton, oh my goodness gracious. Is this guy well, hit clutch shots all the time? God. Uh, maybe this is the emergence of a new quote-unquote dynasty. Who knows? Um, we'll address all that stuff uh, tomorrow. We uh, hope you'll join us for it. Thank you very much for watching or listening, and we'll see you tomorrow.